Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Does everybody want to have a seat? Good morning. I am, I guess I should start by saying good morning. My name is Heather Fenyus, and I am so proud to welcome you all to our annual Holocaust education program here on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis people. I'd, I'd like to begin just quickly with a few thank yous. First of all, I would like to thank both of the school divisions for their tremendous help and support. Our two superintendents, Scott and Brent, sitting over there, really made everything happen this morning. And we're a very small Jewish community, and so to have the support of the divisions is truly immeasurable. And on that note, I'd like to also thank two very amazing teachers, and I hope you'll wave your hands, Sara Stone and Jennifer Galles, whose classes made the remarkable displays that you saw as you walked in. I hope you had a chance to look at them. We, we at Congregation Agudas Israel do not take all of this help and support for granted. For more than 10 years, the members of our committee understood that to truly learn and act on the lessons of the Holocaust, we need an audience of young people. As a Jewish community, we must remember and memorialize, but without you in the room, we won't ever see change, and each one of you is the reason we're here today. We began many years ago by bringing a survivor to talk to students in our small synagogue, and they spoke to 2,000 students for over two days. In fact, Max did that about five years ago. And the survivors are a bit less young, and telling such emotionally draining stories four times a day was exhausting. In fact, Max said to us, this is insanity, right? <laughs> we didn't know what to do. But before we could consider our options, then Bishop, now Archbishop Don and Father David, invited us into their home. Now, four years later, our Jewish community has come to share this sacred space. We were worried the Holocaust, like all genocides, is a global event. But the story of six million murdered Jews is our story. We worried that we would lose an essential piece of ourselves and our message if we stopped telling it in our own home. And then the first year happened, and we the teachers became the students. We learned something that I hope you feel as you leave here today. We learned that sharing our story of the Holocaust will always be personal. Each of us is connected through blood, love, or memory to the dark history but in the sharing, the learning is far more powerful and the possibility of change is so much greater. A Catholic church and a synagogue coexisting is not just an act of generosity, it's a step of change. In Judaism, we call this charge to create change and repair our world tikkun olam. We're taught that it's not simply a good deed to make the world a better place, it's a requirement. The Holocaust is one of the darkest periods where pure racism, pure racism was the justification to murder 12 million people, six million Jews. It's a particular moment in history, unlike no other, where a genocide of strate such strategic and calculated measure against one people took place. Jews were butchered, gassed, burned, drowned, experimented on, tortured, and annihilated for one crime, being born Jewish. The Holocaust didn't just happen overnight. It didn't begin with death camps, but with small, dangerous hate speech. And from these seeds, it grew into a mass killing machine. 
Many of you have come to Canada recently and from many countries where your freedom and safety were not valued. You endured hate and persecution and came to North America for a promise of better and we're not doing as well as we should be. The lessons of the Holocaust seem to have fallen on some deaf ears all over the world and even here in Canada. As Canadians, we've only just begun to listen, acknowledge, and apologize for the atrocities committed against our First Nations Canadians, let alone address the ongoing racism that is still dangerously and insidiously existing and permeating our homes and our culture. In 2017, a terrorist killed six innocent people praying at a mosque in Quebec. This October, 11 people praying peacefully in their synagogue in Pittsburgh were brutally murdered. And last month in a New Zealand mosque, 50 victims were gunned down in the middle of evening prayers. Here in Canada, hate crimes are on the rise. Stat Statistics Canada released a report in November of 2018 and they noted that after a steady but relatively small increase since 2014, police reported hate crime in Canada rose sharply in 2017, up 47 percent over the previous year, 47 percent. Hate crimes against the Jewish population increased for the second consecutive year and accounted for 18%, 18% of all of the hate crimes in Canada. And, and just so you understand, the Jewish community makes up what, less than 1% of the entire Canadian population. We're almost not even a statistic and almost one in five of every hate crime in Canada is directed towards us. We have a problem. Folks, you aren't here by accident. Your teachers brought you here because they believe that every single one of you can and must be the change to end the hate that has no place in our homes, our communities. You are the people you must be the change. The Holocaust has impacted a large majority of Jews all over the world. My husband Leslie, who's here, we're married and have three children because despite unimaginable odds, his parents are going to tell you what he endured and how he survived. So, one, the cup. Max can put his, and chances are in your entire life, you will never meet somebody who survived. Three weeks before liberation. Had she survived, she would have been 91 years old, the same as I. She would have been a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. How many books could she have written by now? And all these terrible things. There was a supremacist Nazi ideology. Started with words. Words are very powerful. You put out a bad word, you can never take it back. And this is what they used, they manipulated the propaganda. And many people bought it and got on board. So um, Jews were given labels, like many other people are given labels today. There were other genocides. Is this working? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I'll have to give this a bit of time, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> so um, it started in Nazi Germany with racial loss against Jewish people, or what Jews can and cannot do. Systematically removed, their livelihood was taken away. They were boycotted, they were... Can you just check this? Over there. Over here? Oh, okay. Oh, all right, over there? Okay, okay. 
Got it. But I can't see it. <laughs> so. so I lived in this amazing country of Czechoslovakia, a democratic country, just like Canada. In 1939, Czechoslovakia was the first victim of Nazi Germany. My country was partitioned, divided into three parts, and where I lived, we were given to Hungary. And as it happens, uh, we were all ethnic Hungarians, we spoke Hungarian. I learned Slovak when I started school. <clears throat> I was six years old. I had an amazing childhood until I was 10 years old. And in 1939, all this changed, drastically changed. Hungarian troops marched into my part of the world, Hungarian gendarmes, Hungarian teachers, bureaucrats. And our life began under a fascist rule where these edicts were being posted in my town on a daily basis of what Jews can and cannot do. The first edicts, we had a small distillery and a drinking place called a cellar. It was simply taken away from him. He was not compensated for this. All the able-bodied Jewish men from 18 to 45 had to report to labor battalions. And they were gone for years. My father, my uncle. Jewish people were not allowed to have any non-Jewish people working for them. My mother had a helper whose name was Anna. She came to live with us when I was born in 1929. And in 1941, she had to leave. She didn't want to go because she was part of the family. Two gendarmes arrived, and they removed her forcibly from our home. So my mother's task became even more difficult. We, we lived in a beautiful house, but you know, we had no running water. There was no central heating. We had fireplaces. We had a well in the yard. <clears throat> we had a big orchard. And I had my grandfather, my extended family, who taught me so many skills and work ethics as a child. I have to tell you, I was not a good student in school. We lived in a farm area, as if they prepared. My parents, my two younger brothers, and I had a little sister. In the center of this house lived my paternal grandparents and their daughter, my Aunt Bella, who was an invalid, also taught me how to read. And when I was five years old, I finished all the books by Jules Verne. And truly books, in 42, we Jewish kids were thrown out of school. <clears throat> we had to wear a yellow star. We Jewish kids were less than 10% of the student body. Mother, in her wisdom, she took me to a large city in my in 1943, my Aunt Bella died suddenly. Her life simply gave out. And in hindsight, it was truly a gift from God that he took her away. Just a year prior to that, in 1942, my maternal family, who were the larger part of my family, the Friedman family, they had a big farm. And they lived in Slovakia. Terrible thing. When you live in those kind of a fascist states, the news are censored and controlled by the government. Her brothers, sisters, nieces, everybody was gone. A few months later, the a few months after my maternal family government occupied Poland, was called the general government. And the stamp said Lublin district. We are working on farms, and we are awaiting your arrival. Some 10 other families received similar postcards. It was a bit of good news. Everybody was wondering, could this be true? You wanted to believe it, that it was true. I found out years after I was liberated that actually what happened, these Jews who were deported from Slovakia before they were put into the gas chambers in a death camp called Majdanek near Lublin. They were forced to write postcards to their families in Hungary. You see how the Nazis were planning two years ahead of how they're going to deal with Hungarian transports in 1944. <clears throat> so in 1943, 
Two events, my aunt died, she was buried, and they made a casket from my grandfather's lumber yard, um, and she has a marker in this town called Moldova, which is now in the Slovak Republic. There is only a remnant of the stone that remains. Many stones disappeared. Others are broken down, but are to the four corners of the globe. In August of 43, my mother gave birth to a little girl. You know, that was not a good year for a Jewish child or a Jewish mother to give birth. 1944, 75 years ago, April 14, April the 14th, we were celebrating Passover. The first night of Passover was on Friday night, so it was the Sabbath and Passover. And by some miracle, my father and uncle were home from their labor battalions, and we prepared special foods for this event. And we had a beautiful spread of certain foods that we only eat on Passover. And we sat down to tell the story of the Exodus. I can see my entire family, my little baby sister in the crib. She was about eight and a half months old. And the youngest son always asked the father four questions. Why is this night different than any other night? Why do we eat bitter herbs? Simply, we eat bitter herbs to remember how terrible it is to be slaves. Why are we leaning back on a cushion like a king, even though we're living in a fascist country? Because, you know, this is freedom. You're a free person. And then we say, all those who are hungry, come and join us. And we retired about 12 o'clock at night. This is 1944, April the 14th. And my grandfather, my uncle, and my father, we, they were out in the yard. We had a big yard. We had a big Alsatian who was our guardian. His name was Farkas, which is a Hungarian word for a wolf. <clears throat> my grandfather, he sort of understood politics. My grandfather was a non-commissioned officer in the cavalry of the Austro-Hungarian Empire during the First World War. He was on the Russian front for over two years. And he said, if we manage to survive four to five months, we are going to be liberated by the Red Army coming from the East. And we retired, went to sleep, and we thought next morning we'll get up at a leisurely time and we'll go to the synagogue and repeat this dinner for the second night. So for my family, my immediate family, and thousands and thousands of other Jewish families in Hungary, this truly was their last supper, never to be repeated in thousands of communities in all of continental Europe. Early morning, Farkas was barking his head off. We hear a bang, we had a big gate to enter our property. Seconds later, our door to our bedroom was kicked in. There were two Hungarian gendarmes. Hungarian gendarmes are not like the police that you know here. They're a very crude bunch. They wear these black riding boots. They have a black felt hat with red rooster feathers. They're in your bedroom. They're yelling and screaming. You have two minutes to pack a bundle, and we are taking you away. If you have any money or jewelry, hand it over, because where you're going, you're going to have no need of this. Think about it. What would you want to take with you on a journey? You don't know where you're going. My mother, she was thinking practically. She grabbed my little sister in her arm, and she told us to put on layers of clothing. My father said, put your boots on. We had custom-made winter boots. There was a Jewish shoemaker in town, a Mr. Goodman, who made our winter boots. And thanks to him that those boots that lasted for a year saved my life. And my father went into the quarters of my grandparents to see how they were doing. My grandfather was 77 years old, this big man, 
and my grandmother was 75, and we were hustled out from our home, taken by two gendarmes like a bunch of criminals. The gates were locked, and 500 Jews were delivered into the school. And so we were put into two school rooms, 250 people per room, and spent the first night, the second night of Passover, locked up in the school. It was a terrible night. You know that your home is five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes walk from this place, and we are guarded by Hungarian gendarmes. We're sealed off. So I want you to think of what happens in a town where 10% of their population is removed, forcibly removed from their home, locked into a school. What would the other people be doing? Would they be thinking, what is happening to those people? Do they need something? Do they need water or do they need comfort or food? Well, I found out when I came back a year later, <clears throat> this lady who was a neighbor of ours, whose name was Ili Klinka, a Christian lady. She was a very good friend of my mother and my aunt. And her son and I, we were in the same class. She told me that while we were sealed off in the school, every single Jewish home was ransacked to the bare walls. We Jews have lived in that part of the world when the Romans were there. 70 AD, there's records that Jews lived in that part of the world. Hungary was called Pannonia. Budapest was called Equincum. And my family have lived there for generations. We lived with these people for generations, supported each other, did business with each, with each other. <clears throat> The synagogue, the prayer books, and the Talmudic books were put in a pyre and torched. The scriptures were taken out of the ark and cut into ribbons and worse. Next morning, 500 Jews from my town were assembled in the schoolyard. Mothers were not allowed to have their carriages to make the journey from the school to the railway station a little easier. So my mother had a baby in her one arm, a bundle in the other arm, and some utensils in a sheet on her back. And everybody had their own bundles. It was really a show, an exodus. They made the rabbi, he was an elderly gentleman, Rabbi Tenenbaum with a long white beard, to walk in front of the column. Here's the rabbi leading Jewish people out on an exodus. We didn't know where this is going to lead us. 500 Jews left, 480 didn't come back a year later. There were only 20 survivors from my town. There was only one mother with two teenage daughters. Her son, who was in the same class and I, didn't come back. And we were taken to a big city called Kosice, which is now in the Slovak Republic. Jews were collected in huge brickyards not far from main railway stations where transportation would be easy. 30,000 Jews were packed in into this brickyard. We spent three weeks there. There was a communal latrine for 30,000 people. Two taps of water coming in. My mother couldn't cook. She had a baby to feed. The other mothers had babies to feed. They had no milk. Babies were wilting away. You could see them by the hour. There was an SS officer that came to the brickyard six days in a row. This is how propaganda works. He was telling us, you're going to be resettled in the East. Families will be together. And you will be working on farms. And I kept thinking of two years before in 1942 when this postcard came from my Slovak family from Lublin district. I thought that I'll be meeting these gorgeous cousins of mine. We are loaded into cattle cars, 100 people per cattle car. And suddenly, Hungarian military police appeared from nowhere. Every cattle car, the doors were locked and bolted down. And I knew that instant that we are really in a box. 
You know what it's like to be 100 people in a cattle car? Like a can of sardines when you open it up and you see how they are loaded. You cannot move around. You're standing in one spot for four nights and three days. It is a terrible journey. I couldn't see my mother. She was stuck with a baby in a corner. I couldn't see my two younger brothers. They were stuck between taller people. The stench. Initially, they gave us a pail of water and a pail for a toilet. And that was never replaced. The water was never replaced. And all that stuff was floating around. Two old people died. We couldn't dispose of the bodies. So you're rolling with a train. The train is, you can hear the clicking of the wheels on the joints of the track. And suddenly you hear the whistle of the locomotive. And you wake up with a start, and you think that you just had a nightmare. <clears throat> Realizing that you're actually living a nightmare. And then the train came to a stop, and I knew that this was the end of the journey. We have finally arrived. There was a lot of moving back and forth. I could hear German being spoken. Suddenly, the door of our cattle car opened up. Light flooded in. There was a man in a striped jacket and a cap, and he was yelling at us in German, Raus schnell, out fast. Just moving. Uh, when I came back, this lady, Ili Klinka, she gave me the biggest treasure that she could have given me, four pictures of my family. As our home was ransacked, these pictures were flying through the air. So this is a picture that was taken in 1940. By the order of the police, every Jewish family had to be photographed. So you can see the date. I'm not sure you can see it, but... <clears throat> Uh, on the right side, this is my younger brother, Eugene, and Alfred. And Eugene was a genius. Everybody in town knew that this kid is going to be a real genius. He never had a chance to spread his wings. And here is a cattle car that is standing in Auschwitz-Birkenau, Auschwitz II, as a memorial on the track. So this is the entrance to the death camp of Birkenau Auschwitz II. You come through the opening in this big guardhouse, 99.9% .9 will never leave this place. This place is laid out. It's a place of industrial killing. Over a million and 200,000 people were murdered here including 450,000 Hungarian Jews in the last year of the war. Can you imagine? Do you think Hungarians could have protected these 450,000 Jews? Of course. Was there a will to do it? No. In fact, the Red Army arrived four months after, and we were already in 450,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered by them. And this is the death camp. So you arrive, the doors are open, the people are removed from the cattle cars, your bundles are left in the cattle car. It's a place of deception. These people are telling you, don't worry about your bundles, you'll have it delivered. <clears throat> there are SS guards and officers standing on the platform. Right there. And there is a selection. Men and women are separated. You can see an SS officer with white gloves. It was quite often it was a Dr. Mengele, who was also called the angel of death, who was doing experiments on thousands and thousands of twins. He wanted to know how each German woman could have multiple birds. And these are the SS units of the a division called the Death Head Division of the SS, the Totenkopf Division. 
who were in charge of hauling Jews from all across continental Europe to the death camps. There were no goodbyes set here. My mother with a baby in her arm, my two little brothers, my grandfather and grandmother and my aunt, they were told to go to the left. They are going for disinfection. I was 15 years old. I never heard this word disinfection before. My father and uncle and I, we were selected simply by a lick of his finger, you know, showed us to go to the right. We didn't know what it was. We were in the clutches of an SS unit. They took us to a barrack. Our clothes were taken away from us. Our hair was shaved. We were put through a shower and wound up in a wooden barrack in triple tier bunks. Women who were selected for slave labor were processed in the women's camp. Their hair was shaved. But my mother, anybody who was holding a baby in her arm, they called these people lives not worth living. They were simply marched into the gas chamber and crematoria too. 2,000 people at a time. The metal doors were locked and the gas pellets were dropped in from the ceiling, Zyklon B gas, and it took these 2,000 people anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes to die a collective death. This is something that will haunt me for as long as I live. While these people were in the agonies of death, SS officers were looking through reinforced peepholes to watch this. So one of those guards that you just saw was this guard here, Oscar Groening. <clears throat> There's a documentary, The Accountant of Auschwitz. Actually, he was called the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. I just want to tell you a bit of the process of what they did with living Jews and dead Jews. They had it all figured out. The Nazis laid it all out in the final solution the bundles were taken to barracks and they went through everything. People would bake in a gold coin in a little bun. They would hide currency in their shoulder pads. Whatever they brought with them, they were determined to find everything. The bodies that were gassed, they smashed their jaws and the gold fillings and gold crowns were ex extracted. The gold was melted down into bricks and all this loot, Oscar Groening, in a metal suitcase, was carrying this to the Reichsbank in Berlin. So he was asked in court, did you ever receive a receipt for this? He said, no. He was a very talkative SS man. He was 96 years old. He said, I was there. I saw it. I heard it. I smelled it. I wasn't part of the killing machine. It was only a clog, but you know, a machinery doesn't work unless every, cl every clog is whole. And that's what he was doing. <clears throat> so, my father and I and my uncle, we were marched down the road. We were given tattooed numbers and striped outfits. We were no longer human beings. We were only a number. We marched down to uh, Auschwitz I. This is his comrade, as he called it, with the insignia of the skull and bones, Reinhold Hanning. They both said that they feel no guilt. They were given four years. They both died last year. They never served a day in court. Um, so you become a slave laborer. So let me just tell you in a few minutes what it's like to be a slave laborer working for the Nazis. You're 15 years old. You have a cap, a jacket, your pants, and your good boots. Because if you don't have boots, you're a, you have a pair of wooden clogs, which is a piece of two by four with a piece of canvas stapled on it. And your work day is anywhere from 10 to 12 hours of hard labor and your food intake is 300 calories. 
a liquid diet, a cup of tea in the morning, and you march out to the work site out in the field, five, six, seven, eight kilometers. Lunch is a ladle of soup that smelled to high heaven. And I said, I'm not going to eat this. And my father and uncle, they practically crammed it down my throat. And you know, three days later, that soup tasted pretty good. The trouble was there wasn't enough of it. You work till six, seven, back-breaking work. You march back to camp and you receive your dinner, which is a cup of Herzat's coffee, a slice of bread and a tiny square of margarine. And you know what it does to your body? Your body is simply disappearing in front of your eyes. <clears throat> they had it systematically, scientifically figured out that your lifespan here will be no more than three to four months. So how do you exist on a daily basis? My father and uncle were truly my guardian angels. We were together for two months. They kept me going. And you know, all those work skills and things that I learned that was hammered into my head by my grandfather and my mother. Here you had to be as tough as nails. Imagine you have no underwear, you have no socks, you have no toilet paper. Every day is the same, same, same. You need to be focused. My father kept insisting, you need to put one foot in front of the other. As Viktor Frankl, who was a psychologist who was in Auschwitz, he wrote in a book, Man's Search for Meaning. He observed the people who survived. He said, those that had a why, they found a how. You had to have a goal. You had to be determined. You had to be resilient. My father and uncle were selected out. Selection was a deadly word. So this is how a selection happened in the middle of the night. You're sleeping the sleep of the dead. You're that tired. And suddenly the loudspeakers are turned on in Auschwitz one, powerful loudspeakers. And as soon as you hear the crackling of the loudspeaker, <clears throat> you have this uh, action, your body knows you fly right out of your bunk. And it said, Achtung, Achtung. All inmates from these barracks go down naked and go to this building, to this barrack for selection. Remember, Achtung, Achtung. And they were selected out. Next morning, I had to go to work. We were in two separate units. I came back at night. There was a quarantine block, a barrack in Auschwitz one that was fenced off from the rest of the camp. And I went to this quarantine barrack. <clears throat> there were people milling around, and I was yelling their name. And finally, I managed to see them. And they came to the fence, and the guard in the tower kept yelling, if I don't move, he let loose with a machine gun bullet. My father gave me a blessing, and he told me that if I manage to survive, I must tell the world what happened here. I was devastated. I knew that this is the end of my family. And you know, in the men's camp, there was nobody that would take you under their wing. It was different in the women's camp. The women joined they had lager schwester, lager sisters. They had support groups to support each other. So another Holocaust survivor, Primo Levi, he wrote in his book, unless a door opened for you, you could not crawl out of this nether world. So my door that opened was I had a terrible beating. My head was smashed in by an SS guard. I lost a lot of blood, I went into shock, I couldn't get up on my feet, and I knew that my life was finished. They had to drag me back on a two-wheeler that carried all the implements. I was dumped in a barrack 21 in Auschwitz one. this was a surgical department. There were two Polish political prisoners, Dr. Tariusz Zeszko and his assistant. <clears throat> and um, I mean, I was out. I opened my eyes the next morning. I was upstairs in a ward. And these two doctors came to see the people that they operated on. So the story was as follows. You were operated on, if you couldn't walk away two days later, 
You were put on a stretcher and loaded on a truck that took you to the gas chamber. This was part of the deception in Auschwitz I. They brought the International Red Cross and they showed them, look, we take good care of our workers. We have a surgery. So there were two kinds of doctors in Auschwitz. Those that they all swore the Hippocratic Oath, which means that you will do no harm to people. There were hundreds of doctors with Dr. Mengele who did experiments on twins. They did castrations on teenagers. They gave high doses of x-rays to women so they can never bear children. Body parts were shipped from here to all the teaching universities in Germany and Austria. This was the industry of the Nazis in Auschwitz. So two days later, I was put on a stretcher, and they were taking me through in the middle of the barrack to the uh, trucks, and Dr. Rojeshko, who was standing in the doorway of the prep room, and he took me off the stretcher, and he gave me a lab coat, and I became the cleaner. I ran the operating room. I worked for him for six months. That saved my life. So, um, I just have a couple of minutes, so I'll just go through this fast. <clears throat> this is Dr. Rojeshko over there, and I met his family in Warsaw. That's the operating room. That was a death march from Auschwitz to Mauthausen in Austria, 13 days. This was Liberation Day. This was the unit that liberated me, an American tank unit, 761st Black Panther Tank Battalion. This was a crack unit that operated on General Patton's Third Army. This is my Danek. That's my home, and there's Lady Ili Klinka. I arrived in Canada October the 25th. And um, I'm a very lucky guy. These are our great, three great-grandchildren. Um, they live in Jerusalem. And uh, 10 years old, 8 years old, and 5. This was taken a couple of years ago. And this is my life truly was by chance that I even managed to get here. We found, we went back to the Slovak Republic, we found the stone of our great-grandfather. It's very remarkable. The cemetery was moved. They have a soccer field there now. This is in a corner. There's only a few stones that are still standing. So remember, Achtung, Achtung, when the people were taken for selection in Auschwitz I. Look at this picture of me. This was Toronto, July last year. A picture of me standing beside a synagogue in Toronto. Somebody painted the word Achtung on my forehead. It said that the Jewish Federation supports Holocaust education. So this poison has arrived in this wonderful country. So um, I think I'll leave it here. Should we? We'll have some questions. Yeah, yeah I'm saying here. <clears throat> I have a few more things to say to conclude with, but first we'll have some questions, if you have any. We have some time for questions. We're going to bring up two microphones, so why don't we start? I know you have questions. There are no bad ones. Keep the microphones in line, and uh, we can ask them to a question. It always takes somebody to ask them. story? Is there a favorite piece of the story you didn't have a chance to tell? Well, <clears throat> by chance alone, you know, we couldn't come up with a name. Um, we have thousands of names. So um, when you publish a book, you sign a contract, and you have to live by the contract. So on a Friday, Harper Collins tells me, look, we have to have the name of the book and the cover by Monday morning. I said, <clears throat> why don't you leave it with us over the weekend? Monday morning, I opened my email, and there was a name by chance alone, and I knew this is right on. I said, this is great. 
and the cover. So when my book was launched in 2016, about a month later, somebody called me from New York, and he said, my name is Josh Eisen. I read the book, we are cousins. I said, really? He said, well, I'm getting on a plane, I'll be there, I'll be in Toronto tomorrow. He arrived in Toronto, he brought a family tree. I didn't know that my grandfather had six siblings, four boys and two girls, who emigrated to the United States in 1919. Nobody ever told me that. So a year later, we had a, a gathering in Manhattan. 92 people came, three generations and four generations. Had I not written this book, I would have never found this extended family. So my great-grandfather, whose stone you saw here, he must have been a very smart man because he came from a very tiny little place. He had eight children, and he told them, look, you better go to the new world and make your fortune there. Wow. So... <laughs> It's amazing. Do you understand the significance of that? Max's entire family, but I think for two relatives, were murdered. So were it not for this book, he wouldn't have discovered other relatives. We have some questions. Sure. What advice do you have for us? What advice do you have for us? Well, I was going to conclude with this. When you see X, like my face was painted over, or you see acts of hatred, when you see something, you need to say something. The only way we're going to get over this terrible, you know, this is a sickness. Everyone needs to stand up and say, we will not allow you to do this in my school, in my town, in my city, or in my country. The only way we're going to get over this, if we respect each other, respect, not tolerate, respect, no matter what color or religion we are. This is the only way we're going to keep this country safe. And believe me, there are not many countries in the world where you are safe as in this country. So if we want to keep this a safe country, a freedom, this, these are the things you need to keep in your head and your heart every moment of the day. Thank you. Okay. Um, what was the scariest thing you witnessed with your eyes? What was the scariest thing that you witnessed with your eyes? I don't even want to paint a picture for you. I mean, I've seen some terrible things. I've seen where humans were ground away. Can you see mountains of bodies on, when we were liberated in Avon's Day? This tank unit, they were in total shock. This was a battle-tested tank unit. They came through the Battle of the Bosch. They were in shock. I met Johnny Stevens years later. There were tens of thousands of bodies that were not disposed of. This was May 1945. The Americans brought in huge bulldozers, they dug trenches. I was sick, I had, everybody had typhus. We were just barely hanging by a thread. And they brought up the townsfolk from Avonsay. These people who said, no, we never knew well, what was happening just up the hill. And they had to carry these bodies and drop them into these trenches. And I remember watching, it's like they were carrying rag dolls and simply dropping them in. They had no names, they were somebody's children or somebody's parents or whatever. That was a terrible thing. But you know, to survive that from day to day, you had to steal your heart, you had to be as like a stone. And this was a terrible thing. So that was pretty awful. Thank you. I, I hope you heard what Max said. He, he talked, I, I just want to repeat that because there were so many dead bodies at the end of the war that the civilians couldn't carry them away and they used bulldozers, bulldozers, to put the bodies into the pits. That, yeah. That's quite a memory. <clears throat> yes, and 
So the bodies were, the people couldn't, these bulldozers, that was a horrible thing, they're pushing with their big buckets, and it was covered with lime and dirt, and there were chaplains and rabbis saying their last prayers over these bodies. Yeah. What does, what does being Jewish mean to you? What does being Jewish mean what to you? <clears throat> Look, I was born Jewish, my great-grandparents were Jewish, and that's what Jewish means to me. Um, it's not easy sometimes to be Jewish, you know. And it affected Jews in many different ways. Many Jews left the, uh, the religion because they were always thinking that they changed their name if it sounded too Jewish. But no, I say that I wouldn't do that. So, to me, it's a tradition, and I'm very proud of our heritage, of what Jews have done over the centuries. Uh, they contributed both. And today, um, there's a little Israel that contributes per capita on a, such a large scale to the world in medicine, in science, in farming, and in health. So, I'm very proud to be a Jew. Thank you. Are those camps still there? Are those camps still there? Auschwitz one and two are there. And many of the wooden barracks are falling down. They will not be replaced. There'll be a few barracks that were restored. There are some brick buildings. Auschwitz one will be standing there for a long, long time because that Auschwitz one is military barracks of the Polish army before World War II. And many other camps are wood is deteriorating, so but the area is there and it's unreal that civilization has moved up and built homes practically almost to the fences, to the perimeter fences. So it's almost like in a it's in a city now. So but it's I know that in Auschwitz there are over two million visitors that come every year. So it's important to go and see it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how were you feeling before you went to the camp and after you left it? How were you feeling before you went to the camps and then after? When I go back to the camps, I've been going back. <clears throat> I go back every year with groups. This is my 20th time that I will be going back. The hardest time for me to go back was in 1998, when our granddaughter was 16. She was 10 years old, and she heard about March of the Living. We call it March of the Living. And I was in shock when she said, I want to go on the March of the Living. I never wanted to go back. And six years went by so fast, and she said, I'm... So I said, I'm going to go with you, because I didn't want to leave my granddaughter to go on this horrible trip alone, you know, with a bunch of teenagers, you know. But, and it was very hard to go back, to stand there, at gas chamber and crematoria, two, two, three, four, and five, you know, can you imagine? Four huge engines. And introduce her to her first family. Who, you know, my parents and grandparents never had a chance to meet my wife. They never had a chance to meet their grandchildren. And that was the hardest thing that I did. But I've been going back there for 20 times. If you could go back in time, what would be the one thing you'd go turn back? You could turn back. If you could go back in time, what would be the one thing you would turn back? Oh, I would love to see my family. Uh, I would love to say thank you to my mother. <clears throat> that was so sudden, that parting, there was no goodbye said. And... Um, just to see what we could have achieved, what my younger brother would have been. And uh, so there's a f that's a very complicated question. You know, there's a few things that I would love to see. But yeah. you have to deal with the cards that you have, you see.
How dreadful was this prison camp compared to past prison camps? to other camps? Well, Auschwitz I, where I spent nine months, was, I call it the four seasons of camps because it was brick buildings, can you imagine? We had indoor plumbing because it was an army camp and indoor, you know, in, in, indoor toilets and wash basins, you know, galore. All the other camps were built like Lego toys. There was... Um, wooden barracks, and there was a communal toilet. If you go back to Birkenau, you'll see a slab of cement with, I don't know, a hundred holes where people would sit body to body. That was so demeaning, can you imagine? And there was somebody standing there, you couldn't spend more than a few seconds in a toilet. <clears throat> so, what was the question? I, I'm afraid, actually, we have to stop the questions okay. because the, the bishop has to leave, and we would really like to invite him in his home to come up and say a few words. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm afraid we have to stop our questions now because we have a special visitor. I'll be here if you want. Whose home we are in. And we cannot be in, in the, the home of the bishop without inviting him to say a few words. And he has to leave. If we have time for more questions, we'll come back. But I, uh, I'd like you to uh, give your attention to the bishop, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, firstly, I, I was, I'm enjoying the questions and the presentation. So, I, you know, I hope there's more time because it's important for you to ask the questions. And um, it was good to see the line increasing of young people coming forward. Um, my name is Bishop Mark Hageman. <clears throat> I've been bishop here for a year and a half. And it, it is an honor to welcome uh, our speakers and the uh, Jewish community here in Saskatoon to make this presentation. I, I visited uh, Birkenhau and Auschwitz as a young man. I was uh, 24 years old. And I also worked in a kibbutz in Israel, Mayan Baruch, the Northeast Finger, back in 1984. And most of you probably weren't born in 84. It wasn't that long ago, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, and a, a couple of things. I grew up as a young Catholic Christian young guy. And there was always a very strong connection because of, of the Hebrew scriptures and the stories that are common in our faith with the Jewish people. And it was such an honor and a privilege to go to Israel and uh, be a part of a Jewish community uh, as a young man and to experience the life. And, and I would say I experienced a mix of culture and religion amongst the Jewish people of Mayan Baruch. Um, people were very excited about coming back to the state of Israel and forming a community of, of culture and life uh, where they would continue to recover from the, the, the terrible things that happened after the, during and after the Second World War. And uh, frankly, 40, 50 years is not that long to kind of try to deal with the memories and the horror of what happened. And we're further years away than now, but we still have great challenges. What we're hearing today is extremely important because I hate to say it, it can happen again if we're not vigilant. It can. What are the, I mean, I, I know some of you were probably getting to these questions. What would lead to a Holocaust like that? You know, things slip in when people are afraid, when they're angry, and their anger takes over, and they cease to see the man or the woman in front of them, they do not see their humanity, they do not see their dignity. I liked your point about respect, never lose respect. And then all sorts of rationalizations can cloud our mind 
When we're angry, we're fearful, and we're in a state of contempt. And we can see and do ugly things. I, I kind of have a concern, I, I, I'm not that old a fellow, but you know, I have seen in my lifetime what you see, you know, young men and women in terms of uh, violence and anger is so commonplace and it's out there and it's accessible so quickly on our technology. But deep down, we can never dehumanize anybody. The dignity of any human person is absolutely essential. And we need to work together to realize that. So on the one hand, I regret that some of you look like you're very young and you're hearing about bodies and trenches. But on the other hand, we need to hear this. So it will not happen again. So thank you for sharing with us. And uh, it's really good to be here together today and uh, blessings to you as we continue to hear this, to think back. And there's a saying about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not pretending nothing ever happened. It's not healthy forgiveness. Forgiveness is remembering what happened and through healing and confronting it, we grow together to a better place. And so I pray for that kind of forgiveness and healing as we remember uh, what we're reflecting on today in this Holocaust Memorial. Blessings to you. Thank you, thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Do you know Archbishop de Roche? I do. <laughs> Give him my regards. <laughs> Uh, we, we have more time, so if you want to come back, and I think we still have about 15 minutes for questions, and so Max would be happy to answer them. I, don't, I can't promise we'll get through them all, but we'll do our best. Okay, we oops, have a first question here, so if everyone can listen up, we've got another question. Why did you specifically choose Canada to move to? Why did you specifically choose Canada to move to? Oh, uh, how could I choose any, any other country? <laughs> I love the books. I read about Canada as a child. London, Jack London. Was that Jack London? Yes. Wrote about Canada? Sorry? Jack, was it London, the books about Canada? Yeah. And. Um, you know, after the war, imagine you have come back from the camps and you go back to your home and there's nobody there. That was the most difficult time. How do you pick up the pieces? Think about that. All your support group have gone in once, one year. That's a big, big hit. And um, I wound up in an orphanage. You have no money, you have no family. And this orphanage was a Jewish school of learning, was supported by American joint distribution. And um, a rabbi in Toronto who had a similar school, he sent us permits to come to Canada. But four years after the war, it was very difficult for Jews to come to this country, four years after, Jews and people of color. So finally I made it. It was a very difficult journey, but I was the happiest guy when I, my ship docked in Quebec City. I got off the boat into the terminal, and I kissed the ground. I knew I was home. And I just took off running, and uh, I worked very hard. I had a successful career in business, and I've been speaking to students for 32 years. This is a long career. I've been speaking to students in elementary school. I meet them in high school, I meet them in universities, and I meet them when they are now teachers and I'm speaking to their students. You know, so uh, this country was absolutely an amazing country, and I'll be forever grateful, and all survivors that came here, be forever grateful for this opportunity. If 
you could, if you could ever speak to Hitler, what would you tell him? If you could ever speak to Hitler, what would you tell him? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I would tell him. I don't know if I'd I. <clears throat> it's a good thing that I didn't have to speak to him. He blew his head off or whatever, you know. A despicable psychopath. I don't know what I could tell him. I, <laughs> I'm just lost for words. <laughs> Thank I, you. I would tell him, look at me. Yeah. Look at me. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> you know, we Jews were that close from extinction in all of continental Europe. And we have this march, it just hit me now, March of the Living. This is telling Hitler, I'm not sure whether he, where he is, that we are alive and well. And... Um, it's a very important message, and there's March of the Living. There's not only Jewish kids that go. I've been with Catholic high school students, and there are many Catholic high school students that are going to Auschwitz and visiting these places of uh, horror that were at one time. So, thank you. You're welcome. What, mo what motivated you to keep going and not give up? What motivated you to keep going and not give up? Oh, I, I knew the alternative, you see. Uh, the alternative was a bad place, and I wanted to live. And um, I was very determined. And you had to be determined and resilient and all those things. You know, you couldn't have long-range plans. You could only plan for seconds ahead. But I kept, I was very determined. You never, ever, ever give up. When you are really down and out and you say, I cannot do this, you say, I'm going to do it. So never, ever, ever give up. What about your father's voice? Put one foot in front <clears throat> of the other. And put one foot in front of the other, that's right, yeah. That's his father's words. Yeah. What kind of things happened during your last few months at the camp? What kind of things happened in the last few months at the camp, maybe close to liberation? Well, Evensee, we arrived in Evensee in April, the beginning of April of 45. We knew that the Nazis were finished uh, because we had American fighter planes flying all over the place. There was no more Luftwaffe. But, uh, <clears throat> I was very happy that they're really getting it. I didn't know, I didn't think that we will survive. I figured that they'll kill us all, and in fact, that's what they wanted to do in Abensee. They wanted to blow us all up in these big caves that they were used as storage and uh, warehouses. And um, so, um, what was the question? <laughs> what was just the last few weeks oh, of the last liberation? Few weeks. So imagine in Abensee there was no more work. So three weeks before liberation, they shut the camp, they threw away the keys, they shut the water system off, there was no food given to us, and typhus was rampant, we were infested with lice, they carried the bacteria from body to body, and people were dying by the thousands. And uh, if you read in my book, I was so sick when you have high fever. I was in the lower bunk. I couldn't climb up to the middle bunk. I woke up. I was smelling something. And there was a little pot belly stove there in every barrack. And there were some people sitting around it, and I could smell. It was some meat cooking. It made me sick to smell it. And I, when I had to go to the latrine, I was dragging myself on my stomach. That's where the cadavers were stacked up and there were pinches of their muscle that were still left. It was sort of pinched out and I put two and two together and I thought that this is what they were cooking in a pot. 
And I kept thinking, wow, maybe I'll wind up in that part too. You know, so that was a horrible thing. But you know, people have done this to survive. They'll do anything. That was a horrible thing to, uh, to observe, you know. Did you understand what Max said? Did you hear him? I just want to repeat it in case you didn't hear. In the last few weeks before liberation, Max smelt something and he smelt like meat being cooked. And remember we talked, he told you about the, the number of cadavers, the number of people that had been dying so quickly near the end. Desperate, desperate human beings were cooking the meat of the bodies and that was the sm and eating it. And Max knew that we had, he, world had descended to a new low. And I'm not sure all of you heard that. I think that was worth repeating. Mm -hmm. How did all these terrible events affect you when you were younger? So overall, how, how did all these terrible things affect you? Maybe the person you've become. <clears throat> I'm very vigilant and I read the signs and I go by a lot by my gut feelings. And I've always found my gut feelings, they always led me in the right direction. So I had a wonderful life. And the family, my wife, my sons, and granddaughters, and great-grandchildren, I couldn't have imagined that I will ever had this wonderful years. And you know, all of a sudden I woke up and I'm 90 years old, and I, these wonderful years just went by so fast. So I'm planning for another 10-year plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so our granddaughter, one of them, she's eight years old, and she phoned from Jerusalem. She says, Gram Gramps, she called me Gramps because their mother calls me Gramps. Happy birthday, how old are you? I said, I'm 90. Oh, so your next birthday will be 100. <laughs> So. Okay. okay, last question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Have you, told, have you told anyone or someone close to you this story? Like your grandchildren? Have you, do you talk about this lots with your children and grandchildren and friends? Well, Yehudit, the oldest, um, a few years ago, and I have this number on my arm. And she said to me, Gramps, what is that blue thing on your arm? I said, well, when you are older, your mommy will tell you what it is. No, I want to know now. So I wouldn't tell her. But um, I told my sons, I had to tell my wife when I met her. She was 15 years old. And we went for a long walk in Toronto for kilometers. And she knew some of the things that went on in Europe. In 1943, it was already known in Canada. So um, there were many survivors that didn't tell their children, and that was a terrible thing, because those children are affected very badly. They were afraid to ask their parents. They thought, well, we cannot ask this survivor, you know, what he was. Doing. So I was quite open, and I'll never forget the first time I was asked to come and speak in Barrie, Ontario, at a St. Elizabeth Catholic High School, grade 13. I, I knew the teacher when he was in business, and I got a phone call. His name is Michael Ronan. He said, um, I want you to come and speak to my students. I said, about what? He said, well, you know, the things we've been talking about. I said, okay. So I went to Barry, and um, I stood up, I stood front, uh, in front of the blackboard, and I was so nervous, I wasn't breathing. I thought I'm going to drop dead right there. And uh, so this is my first experience. I haven't stopped talking about it since. So, you know, it's, it's in my new career, but and I'm a very busy person. I travel a lot from coast to coast. Thank you. Any final words? Well, <clears throat> I would just want to say two words, a few words to you. Be strong and of good courage. And these were four Jewish young women. They were in their 20s and 20, 20 and 21 years old. 
This was an act of the Nazis January the 6th, 1945. They were lined up. They worked in a power pavilion where they were making explosives. And um, one of the crematoria were blown up and they wanted to know who did it. And they grabbed these four young girls. And thousands of us had to watch in Auschwitz I. They put them up on, the, uh, uh, on these boxes. The four nooses were hanging down. They were beaten to a pulp. They stood there tall and straight, and they each said two words, two Hebrew words, chazak ve'amatz, to us, to be strong and of good courage. So I want you to be strong and of good courage and um, never be a bystander, be an upstander. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and shalom to everyone. My name is Claudio Jodorkowski. I am the rabbi of Congregation Agudas Israel. For those of you who don't know what a rabbi is, I am the spiritual and religious leader of the Jewish community here in Saskatoon. I feel honored to be this morning in this holy and beautiful sanctuary on behalf of our congregation and its Holocaust Committee. I would like to thank Max for his powerful testimony of life, for sharing with us a little bit of his experience in what was the darkest time in the history of humanity, and also for bringing a message of hope and reconciliation and optimism. We very much look forward to share with Max the weekend, and everyone is invited to join us this Sunday for our Holocaust memorial service where Max is going to speak again. Judaism teaches that remembrance is much more than an intellectual exercise. So as we recall the successes and the failures of the past, we have at the same time a moral obligation to pass on the lessons of those successes and failures to the new generations. If memory becomes only about what we know and what we feel, and we not convey that to others, and we don't engage in transmitting that to others, then our obligation is far from being, from being completed. In a week from today, while the Christian world will be celebrating Easter, the Jewish community will commemorate the holiday of Pesach, Passover, the day when we remember the Exodus, when God liberated the Jews after centuries of being slaves and oppressed in Egypt. And this is the same Pesach that Max talked about, which for him wasn't the beginning of freedom, but the beginning of his oppression and for his family. And what Passover teaches is that the obligation to remember is never fulfilled until we tell and retell the story. Each Jewish family listens to the story of the Exodus, not just to know what happened, but because there is a commandment that says, now that you know what happened, go and tell to your children what you have heard. Today we have heard a powerful story of courage and survival. We have listened to the testimony of a man who not only survived the worst a person can endure, 
but also chose to dedicate his life to share with others his experience so we can learn and something like the Holocaust never happens again. And because we have heard him today, we have now the responsibility to tell others, to tell your friends, your parents, your children in the future. Today we all have the mission of leaving this sanctuary as different people, at least a little bit different, understanding we should never forget, but that's not even enough. We must also pass on the lesson to others. The Jewish community is very proud to partner with our brothers and sisters of the Cathedral of the Holy Family and with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Saskatoon in this important educational event. We are very thankful to Bishop Mark, to Father Ephraim, and all the staff of the Cathedral for allowing us once again the use of this beautiful and inspiring place. Until four years ago, we used to host this event in our synagogue. However, because our space is reduced, we were in need of a more convenient venue. And when we mentioned this to our friends from the Catholic Diocese, they didn't think it twice. We are very thankful of Archbishop Don Volen, who initiated this relationship, Father David Tumbak, who is here with us today and who continued working with us in friendship. And we are very thankful to Bishop Mark and to Father Ephraim, who is also with us today, joining and supporting us and for allowing us to continue and to have the program once again this year. As the rabbi of Congregation Agudas Israel, I always look forward to this special moment. It is very moving and humbling for me to be speaking from this pulpit in this magnificent place. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Judge David Arnett. I'm the Chief Commissioner of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission. I want to thank uh, Max for his story here today. And I want to say to you this morning, something that's happening is very unique here. Saskatoon is very unique in Canada. There's a strong relationship between the Jewish community and the Catholic community led by Rabbi Jordakovsky and Bishop Hagemon and helped by Father Ephraim and Father David. There's a strong positive relationship between, as well, the Saskatoon Public School Division led by Ray Morrison and Barry McDougall, and the Greater Saskatoon Catholic School Division led by Diane Boykel and Greg Shatlane. It's a unique model in Canada, and what you are witnessing today is a testament to that uniqueness. The Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, like all human rights commissions where they exist in the Western world, owe their existence in part to the world's response to the Holocaust, which is embodied in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We all belong to one human family. Race has no biological or scientific purpose. There is only one human family. There is much diversity in that human family, and diversity gives us strength. The motto of the province of Saskatchewan is, from many people's strength. And if you look at the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code, you'll see that the words one human family are contained in it as well as in the Universal Declaration. Respect is central to being a member of that one human family. Just as it is central to the responsibilities of Canadian citizenship. We must respect every human being. Why? Because every human being deserves equal moral consideration. There are no exceptions to that rule. That is a fundamental expectation of Canadian citizens. The world's response to the Holocaust set the foundation for the rights revolution post the Second World War which was created in courtrooms by lawyers. 
And I challenge every student here today, every teacher, every person here today to be part of the responsibility revolution in the first half of the 21st century, which is being created in classrooms by teachers, by teachers like Max. Why? Because rights without responsibilities have no meaning. Canadians have some fundamental responsibilities of their citizenship, and that is number one, to know and understand your own rights so you don't knowingly transgress the rights of others. Secondly, and probably most importantly, you must, as a Canadian citizen, try your hardest to make the world a better place in everything you do. First of all, Canadian citizens must recognize and re re pardon me, reconcile with the Indigenous people in Canada. And there must be respect. It's a responsibility. You must respect your fellow citizens, every one of them. Words matter. The Holocaust began with words. Words have the power to shame, maim, and blame. Hate thought begets hate speech. Hate speech begets hate crime. Words matter. As responsible citizens, you have to remain vigilant, especially now. Anti-Semitism is on the rise around the globe, and anti-Semitism is alive in Canada, as witnessed by the experience of Max just last summer. The evil of anti-Semitism is all around us, and in Canada, it is a new record-breaking heights every year. Don't let your guard down. Don't be a bystander. Every citizen has a responsibility to confront hate and disrespect, which is always born in ignorance, fear, and malice. Mr. Eisen feels a passionate responsibility to relate his story of the Holocaust. Mr. Eisen is a champion for human rights and a great Canadian citizen. It takes strength and courage for a survivor to tell their story. And we all have a reciprocal responsibility, because we've now heard this story, to etch it in our memory and etch it in our hearts. To use it as the fuel to confront hate, however it manifests itself. My fundamental challenge to everyone here today is to be a responsible citizen. And remember, in Canada, there are five citizenship essential competencies. And they are to be an enlightened citizen, an ethical citizen, an engaged citizen, an empowered citizen, and most importantly, an empathetic citizen. So I ask you to all be a great citizen. Make Canada shine as a beacon for respect, responsibility, and harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few bits of housekeeping before we leave. We're going to ask you to exit at the front. I know you came in the side door, but are you giving me a signal? Nope, all good. Um, but we do invite students who haven't had a chance, and if you have time before your buses, to take a look at the powerful displays. And I think we might be ending a little bit early, so you might even have the opportunity to come up and give Max a hug. But before we leave, folks, remember in the beginning, Max asked a few things of us. And I think we need to give him some gifts today. And the first thing he said was, stand up. Stand up. Max, will you join me over here? D did you hear that my friend just turned 90 years young? From where you're standing, with your loudest possible voices, Please join me in singing happy birthday to my friend Max. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Max. Happy birthday to you.
And that concludes our day. Thank you for being with us.